Nate Latimer, your host here of The Big Data Show. Real excited about our guest today. This is uh, Mr. Nick Harmon, uh, owns a hedge fund, blockchain, global capital. And uh, it's going to be an interesting chat, you know, considering the volatility of the you know, Bitcoin world, blockchain, you know, my opinion is definitely the best thing that ever came out of Bitcoin. So I guess, Nick, uh, thanks for being here, first of all. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Nate. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, Nick, give us a little background on yourself, how you got involved with Bitcoin, how long you've been in the game, and uh, tell us about Blockchain Global. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting story. It really started with uh, security. I was trying to figure out how to... Um, I was just looking into encryption in general, learning about different algorithms, um, and I came upon learning PGP and the you know the SHA and all those uh, different encryption methods. Um, and then when I was studying those, I learned about Bitcoin, and um, it wasn't too far off. And so I started messing with it, you know, putting a couple bucks in, thinking it was fun to send you know a couple bucks to a family member and signing transactions and doing it the whole manual way. And then you know I kind of stopped for a little bit, traded you know on and off. Um, didn't really know the importance of it, of what I had found. Um, and then time progressed, went through school. Um, and then I met a family friend who happened to own a volatility fund in the fiat world. And we had just had dinner uh, and a conversation. And uh, it turned out, you know, we got the idea to start a Bitcoin fund together after I had talked to him about, you know, the potential upside of Bitcoin because it was just before the halvening cycle. And um, being used to some of the stuff, I knew what would be happening after the happening cycle. And so we put together a fund structure. Um, and I was very lucky to have a mentor like John because we were able to do it the adult way, the proper way, which mm -hmm. not a lot of people and were. And who's John? I'm sorry. Uh, John Morgan's one of my partners uh, in the fund. Uh, me and him had started the fund and uh, uh, with Garen Rydock and Greg uh, Snow. And we, uh, yeah, we really went in, tried to do everything the right way. We went to Riverless Wahab for our securities law in New York City, um, NAV uh, Consulting for Administration, Richie May for accounting, like all the big dogs. We wanted to do it proper way, be compliant, and make sure that our customers and clients felt safe. That was our most important mission because... That's also your biggest uphill battle is that friction and inertia in that space. You know, yes. a lot of people you know, will look at you know, the crypto world as you know a layer of voodoo to it you know you know even you know people claim money laundering and you know just all the ways people have used crypto um as a whole you know, historically um nefariously i guess i should say well, but like it sounds like you guys are doing it the right way the up and up way so that's why i was really interested in having you on the show is so you know methodically you can educate our viewers on you know what that difference looks like and what the future should really hold within your space. Yeah, the way that we handle things as far as risk management, we want to know all our counterparty risk. Um, we handle our own security, our own cold storage. Um, we make sure that our banking partners are legit, and you know we saw everything that happened with Silvergate. Um, you know, avoided that, avoided the Luna, the FTXs, all this, um, these type of collapses because we do due diligence. Um, we're not the number go up, money, 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 let's get a Lambo type of people. We don't want them as investors. You know, that's not really who we are. Uh, we're more of a conservative fund that likes to have a buy and hold approach where we look at long term cycles. Um, our last buy, for example, was at about 18,000. Bitcoin's now running around 27,000 bouncing between that and like 30. Um, and then we have an artificial intelligence model that takes another portion of the fund and enters and exits the market based on structure. And that's something that I'm super interested in. You know, uh, with this AI boom that's going on, you know, I mean, just the, the algos alone, the algorithms are, are pretty impressive. So, um, you know, making your clients feel safe is super important. Um, you know, being the grown up in the room, so to speak, um, that's you know been through it and you know really understands the technology and how to put those algorithms to use and have a proven track record so that you know they do feel safe uh, is super important. So what does that strategy look like for you guys? How are you doing it? 
So without giving away the, the secret, secret sauce, sauce, of course, <laughs> sure, <right. laughs> um, you know, what we do is we look at the market structure, we look at it at multiple time frames, and then we have a series of decisions that is um, supervised machine learning. And what happens is we watch and we see what these signals uh, show us, and then we decide if we should be in market or out of market. And really, it's kind of like a beta model where we try to stay in as long as we're going up. And once we see that we're going to go flat or into a bear market, we exit and wait for a bull market to return. That way, people aren't losing their capital. You keep your gains, avoid the losses, and go back to you know earning more gains. We are working on an alpha model. It will have a little bit more risk, but you'll be going... Um, long in the uh, bull markets, short in the bear, and you know making. So it really just depends on the client's risk it's, appetite. It's a risk right? appetite. So that'd be a separate fund, of course. Um, that one we had been talking with a company named Endotech, uh, really interesting company that um, you know we had just got to know in the last uh, couple months, and uh, you know we'll see how that goes. But they have some really interesting artificial intelligence uh, teams, and I think they have about seventy quants. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty interested in their institutional technology, but Very leave cool. it at that. Yeah, I'd like to see how that pans out. Like, um, you know, I guess really my question within that space is, you know, with the artificial intelligence tools, you know, engaging the, you know, enter and exit strategy, is it more so an AI babysitter or is it more of a predictor that, you know, you have a great track record with and, you know, your, your winnings – um, are substantially different than, you know, what other hedge funds could do? Um, you know, to be quite honest, I'm safer in the babysitter role because when you try to um, predict the future, when you try to play God, you tend to get humbled. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my personal experience. And so my clients are my family, my friends, you know, people that I talk to every day. And I got to look them in the face if I lose their money, right? Sure. So I, I stay very conservative. We still, you know, for a conservative fund, you know, we're up, uh, I believe, 67% this quarter. So it's not like we're not doing anything. Um, but, of course, we're trying to really manage risk here. And we're trying to keep our clients' funds safe, make sure that they don't end up the victim of a Luna, an FTX scam, anything like that. Because they're out there. There are bad actors in the crypto space. Sure. But there's also good people that have come from the traditional finance world, that have come from big data, have come from AI. And, you know, the progress that we're making is growing rapidly. It's enhancing everything that we do. And it's almost like a race or a war because as you can spin up new, um, I guess you could call them AI uh, workers, you have the ability to run a 70-person trade desk with one person sure you know and so the technology is allowing us to be more efficient be much more efficient as we take you know we're a two and 20 fund so that two percent management fee we're able to work much more efficiently for the same amount of capital wow that's uh, super impressive so like uh, you know trading digital assets uh you know it can always be challenging um you know, especially during like tax season. So, I guess my question would be, like, how does your fund, um, you know, ease that process? Yeah, that's um, a big pain point. Yeah, I would imagine so. Um, I had one year, and I about cried because it was the first year they, you know, really the IRS put something out about digital assets, and I realized when I had to account for every trade. I'd been trading more than I probably should have. Um, it was a personal account that I was having fun with. And, you know, it came from, I think, having an old Bitcoin or two. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, it was definitely a fun account. But when I saw how many trades I'd done per year, it was terrifying. And so the right. beauty of um, Blockchain Global Capital is our back-end office sends all of our investors a simple K-1 form, has everything done for them. They just hand that into their account and CPA they're doing their own taxes. Um, most of them aren't, but, you know, they can just put that right in TurboTax. Um, and then oh, that's convenient. That makes it a lot easier. Yeah, so way, I... way easier. It's one form. It's just like if you got a W-2 or, you know, anything like that. Um, and then the other thing I mean, that a lot of people... Gains are one thing. You know, holding steady is another thing. But preventing loss is, you know, you can pitch gain all day long, but, you know, 
if you pitch loss, that's where people really get terrified. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's really and, like sales 101, you know. And to be honest, you know, you're in a volatile market. You're not going to win every trade. And people need to know that if they're coming into the fund, you know, we don't accept every client because people have to have the appetite for the, the risk that this vehicle has. Mm. Um, it does have great <clears> returns, <throat> but there are days, you know, where you might have a 20% downturn and you have to have the stomach to know that that is going to come back up and you need to sit through some of the volatility. Um, you know, the fund is designed to not absorb as much volatility, but you're still going to have some. Um, but yeah, overall, I think we've, we've got a great group of LPs. Every client that we have, we're super happy with. And uh, I think it's very important to educate the clients that are coming in so they know what to expect, what we provide, um, and really the whole suite that they're getting with Blockchain Global Capital, because it's not just an investment vehicle, it's security, it's compliance, it's keeping everything nice and tight and clean mm -hmm. in a very messy space. All right. And so, so you mentioned, you know, certain types of clients that you would accept and others you would turn down based on risk appetite. So with uh, blockchain global, like what are those, you know, I guess parameters look like those qualifiers. So, yeah. you know, like what, what is your ideal client that you like to work with? Uh, ideal clients are credit investors, um, you know, people that they don't need this money to survive. They're not going to be asking for it back in a month because they can't pay their credit card bills, something like that. So people um, that earn over $200,000 a year or logic, a million plus in net worth or joint spousal yeah. income. Okay, cool. Got it. So, um, yeah, so, we, so that's, we want to so talk to, you know, the big boys, people that are able to, again, if they're throwing in 250000 500000 that is investment money they don't mind sitting with. We have a not a long lockup, but a six month lockup, so people can get used to the volatility without making a stupid mistake of mm -hmm. jumping out the first time they see you know some loss. But um, we haven't had any LPs actually leave our fund. Everybody's still with us from day one. And that's and, incredible. And how long have you guys been around? Uh, we're approaching three years now. Okay, cool. So three years, and nobody's jumped ship yet. That's amazing. No. So uh, I guess that leads me to my next question, which uh, you know. Kind of a hard question that nobody really wants to be asked, but like, uh, I mean, I guess what is your, you know, being in the game, um, what's your projection for, you know, Bitcoin, for crypto, and, you know, like just, you know, your, your fund over the next five, ten years, like what, yeah. what do you guys, what do you guys see futuristically? So we're seeing a lot of adoption, and the adoption's coming from um, government, it's coming from large institutions. It's coming from financial institutions. And so you kind of have what I see as kind of uh, a split. You have the crowd that really believes in freedom, um, transact, you know, freedom to transact, basically that anybody should have the right to be able to send uh, value or money anywhere across the globe instantaneously without censorship. That's Bitcoin. Then you have what most governments are trying to do is take the technology and use it to use their currency and make a digital currency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people have some fears about that because you can control a digital currency. Maybe you bought too much meat and you, that's your limit. But um, that's probably more going to happen in China for the moment. Uh, the U.S. is developing FedNow, which is a payment system. Um, we are looking at a digital dollar coming, but that's inevitable as well, right? You know, everything's on our phone. People live in their phones. You got XR, um, you know, AR, VR, all sure. the types of new realities coming out. So it's it's going to be a brave new world for sure. Um, as far as performance, I think Bitcoin, as we saw debt ceilings just raised, uh, politicians, they're very incentivized to print more money. They run short-term campaigns. They can promise a lot, and if they spend and it doesn't work out they're out of office it's not their problem exactly and so we're which is a shame <laughs> it, it's it's terrible <laughs> it's but we're seeing two kind of uh um trap doors from the system i guess you could say and you've got bitcoin which is kind of digital gold and then you have physical gold and a lot of people are fleeing traditional assets into those kind of safe haven assets trying to avoid you know hyperinflation that's happening in south american countries and african countries um, we don't have hyperinflation, of course, in the U.S., but it is growing, and people are feeling it. You know, a shopping cart that used to cost 200 is now 500 bucks, right? Right. And so that's uh, that's my prediction. I think that as long as governments continue to print, Bitcoin will continue to climb in value because every four years, Bitcoin, 
the amount produced and mined is cut in half, so supply shrinks, and it shrinks and it shrinks where the other side, supply grows and grows and grows. Mm -hmm. So it's basic math, you know, to me. Absolutely. It's almost a seesaw effect, (laughs) you know, or whack-a-mole, whatever you want to call it. So, Nick, I know you have uh, quite the extensive background in helping people uh, achieve government funding. So can you tell us about that a bit? Yeah. um, The government has a lot of grants and loans right now that are not being applied for. They're especially in innovative technology, things that have to do with ESG and clean energy, um, and people just don't know how to apply. You know, Title 17 has a lot of different sections right now. Um, a company that I'm working with, EcoPowers, is looking to secure quite a large, um, you know, loan, very cheap loan uh, from the government in order to uh, really scale their operation up because they're able to fix the produced water problem, which produced water is the toxic water that comes out of uh, producing natural gas. For one barrel of gas, you get 10 barrels of toxic water. Most companies pump that toxic water into the ground and it's been causing earthquakes. You know, they've patented a technology that reduces it between 70 and 90 percent, just doesn't come back up. Hmm. Um, It's just better engineering and that's it. And so um, we're really looking to push that technology forward, reduce some of those issues. Um, Anybody that has an innovative idea that could be clean energy, uh, innovative technology, anything like that, they should look up, you know, Title 17. They should get in touch with the government branches. Um, you know, mining companies get in touch with the Department of Energy, grid resiliency, um, sustainable mining, stuff like that can actually be really good for the country. And we just need to educate politicians and um, people as well as the benefits. Sure. Is, is that something that, you know, you still do in your career now is, uh, you know, help people with that type of funding? Um, you know, should people contact you about that or... Yeah, Are you the, more, more focused on blockchain global or both? <laughs> I definitely have my focus on blockchain global. Um, that's my baby. But I have Harmony Blockchain Consulting is my consulting firm. We handle a lot of side deals, um, help people out that are new in the industry. Anybody that's looking for advice, um, you know, we usually do a free consultation. And after that, depending on where their business needs to go, we help lead them the way. And, uh, yeah, that's very simple business model. We're here to help. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Nick Harmon, I appreciate you being here, brother. That was uh, very educational. He seemed very knowledgeable about both your spaces, all three of them, four of them. I don't know. But uh, that was very enlightening, and I uh, certainly appreciate you being on the show, brother. Thank you so much, man. All right.